Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in. I'm Casey Bryant, and this is the Hat City Hockey Show. Danbury fans, this is a big week for us. The Hat Tricks are beginning their FPHL training camp. The NAHL Junior Hat Tricks play their first game since November 5th this weekend in Johnstown, and the Connecticut Whale drop the puck on their NWHL Lake Placid bubble season this Saturday. If you're starved for hockey, and I know that you are, Make sure you follow at Danbury Hattricks on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for training camp updates, and be sure to tune into the NWHL on twitch.tv to cheer on the whale at 7 o'clock on Saturday night as they open against the Buttes. And while you're popping open new tabs, make sure that you throw SB Nation's The Ice Garden to follow too. I'll be covering the whale as their beat writer, and the staff there is so incredibly talented. Whether you're an NWHL diehard or new to the women's game, The Ice Garden is for you. I want to jump right into our main guest of the week here. He's a familiar face for fans of both the men's and women's game around Connecticut, and there's plenty to discuss for both right now. Take a look. My next guest on the Hat City Hockey Show is a Connecticut hockey mainstay. He spent nine seasons broadcasting AHL hockey for the Bridgeport Sound Tigers. He currently works for Quinnipiac Hockey and the Connecticut Whale, and local fans will recognize him as the voice of the Danbury Trashers. Please welcome Phil Jubileo. Phil. And I see you're representing the Trashers. That's awesome. That's Thank true. You. Yeah, I had to pick this up when they went back on sale. Mm -hmm. I, I still have uh, – I had a winter coat. Like, they literally gave me a winter coat to bring to road games because they didn't like the winter coat I had. So, like, they pull one off the shelf. I still have that. Again, I, I use it to, like, shovel snow. Phil, the, the first thing that I always like to ask all of my guests, uh, and it's kind of coming to – a finish line of sorts as sports kind of picks back up a little bit. What have they been reading, watching, listening to that has sort of kept them going through this whole ordeal? Uh, I have a seven-year-old daughter, now seven, last spring trying to do homeschooling for a kindergarten kid was a gong show. And any parent watching this uh, podcast probably is like, yeah, I get it. And they probably still to an extent feel that way. Luckily now my daughter does go in person two days a week and then the other three days are from home and she's, you know, she's established a bit of a groove and a, and a rhythm in terms of being able to get all her stuff done. And it feels a little bit more uh, normal. It was interesting because now today I'm, I'm really fortunate in that, you know, college hockey is playing and I broadcast Quinnipiac men's and women's hockey and I get to do a lot of games, but that only started up last month. I mean, I think before that it was what a lot of people were doing binge watching TV shows, maybe reading some books, uh, trying to maybe decompress a little bit, not feel so stressed out about things. You know, to be completely honest, I'm a little bit of an introvert uh, to begin with. So I'm not one to openly go about hanging around with large, big crowds on any kind of regular basis. So for me personally, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't terribly different. I'll pick up on the whale and the trashers in a minute, but I want to start at the very beginning of your hockey career, if you'll allow me, because I know your first gig in hockey was in the United States Hockey League with the St. Louis Heartland Eagles, which was a job that you once called, and I quote, an unmitigated disaster, which is something that anyone who has worked in minor league sports <laughs> can certainly relate to. Uh, what was a moment with the Heartland Eagles where you look around and you realize that was a low rent moment when I was working out there? The USHL, first off, is a fantastic hockey league. And it was a really fantastic hockey league back then when I worked in it. To give you a, an idea of some of the players that I covered just in the one season that I worked there, the Waterloo Blackhawks had Joe Pavelski played for the team before he went to Wisconsin. I think even the team that I worked for, and they were they were terrible. They were the second worst team in the league. I don't know how they weren't the worst team in the league. Had a couple of guys that eventually played some NHL games and and most players in the USHL would end up getting uh, division one scholarships. So the games themselves were a lot of fun. If I, if I talk about the Heartland Eagles being an unmitigated disaster, it was probably from just the way the franchise kind of came into being it was a number of hockey parents. None of them had any kind of sports experience, let alone owning a, a team. There was one guy who is a anesthesiologist. Uh, there was, and he was one parent. And there was another one uh, who was a businessman, but his job was selling ice melt 
He had a company that developed like industrial ice melt for, you know, when the roads are icy and whatnot. And, and he sold that. And his kid was a defenseman on the team and he was horrible, but you know, he was the owner of the team. So he was able to get his son <laughs> to play on the team. So you had some of that. So it was a disaster in that aspect uh, from the front office and they didn't draw many fans and we played in a, a really terrible recreational rink. It wasn't, you know, there, there were some seats, but you would get maybe a couple of hundred fans a game. The, the sales right. and marketing that were native to that team didn't really know what they were doing. And I was calling independent minor league baseball uh, for a team, the River City Rascals, and they don't they don't exist now. They recently folded up, I think, a year or two ago. That team in the Frontier League was actually very well run. We would draw over 4,000 fans a game. The fans loved it. They enjoyed it. It was cheap. Free parking. We always said that in our all our commercials. Free parking. <laughs> big deal out there in That's suburban the big St. Louis. Draw, I yeah. Say. <laughs> yeah, I had never called a hockey game before. I was a minor league baseball guy before that. I did football and basketball. I'm doing minor league baseball. And we strike this deal with the USHL and the Heartland Eagles and the owner of the team, Ken Wilson, who was a longtime broadcaster. So he did St. Louis Blues hockey for 20 years. He did a whole bunch of Major League Baseball. He called Pete Rose's uh, base hit that beat Ty Cobb's hit record. He was the play-by-play -play announcer on TV that day. He's like, hey, Phil, how would you like to do hockey play-by-play? -play? And I'm like, I've never done hockey play-by-play. -play. In fact, at that point, I had literally been in person to one hockey game, in person, uh, which was a St. Louis Blues game, which was our Christmas party the, like, in 2002. <laughs> Christmas of 2002, we had a staff outing and had a luxury suite at the Blues game. That was the first time I had ever been to an NHL game. It's a good Christmas party. But I had called a lot of other sports, and I was mentored for three years by Marty Glickman, again, mainly in football and basketball. But his lessons really taught me to call anything. And, and I used a lot of that and some of what Ken taught me. And I got that first gig from there. And, and, you know, now 18 seasons later, here's where I am. Look, futility is a part of the game, as anyone can mention. I, I'm from Poughkeepsie. So the one pro hockey team that we've ever had in Poughkeepsie was the Hudson Valley Bears in the Eastern Professional Hockey League, which was the same league as the Danbury Mad Hatters once upon a time. Okay. They were, they were three and 47 that year. <laughs> But oh boy, what a what a three games they were! What a storied run! They three, were hey, look, three wins, three <laughs> wins or three wins. It's better than zero wins, right? It's better than going over fifty. That's true, 50. and and it's better than the team in the Fed last year that set the record for the worst pro record in hockey, the Battle Creek Rumble Bees, who were oh yeah, one no, I was aware of that. Oh. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned Battle Creek, and um, I I because he was in the United League when I was working with the Trashers, Terry Ficarelli, who you probably had a phone yeah, call with. Fick. Yeah, I'm sure you had a phone call or some sort of interaction with Fick, who's a, who's a legend. I mean, he's been doing this now for 50 years. He is one of the more unique people that you'll ever come across uh, doing hockey. I actually just saw he's back in Muskegon. There, there's something really? brewing in Muskegon. I don't know what it is, but he's there. And uh and apparently they're making a big deal about it. But yeah, so I felt bad for Fick because he had to do a whole season of, of winless hockey. And, you know, he's a guy that had called multiple Colonial Cups and usually was involved with winning teams. And I'm like, oh, this has got to be awful. That's what builds broadcasters. That's what makes you better. Anyone can sound good with a winning team. You know, give me, give me the broadcaster that, you know, works for a team that loses, you know, 70% of their games. And if you're entertaining doing that, you could do anything in this business. Absolutely. I remember there was one junior game that I was calling in New Jersey for the Jersey Hitmen of the USPHL, mm -hmm. where it was an eight nothing Jersey lead heading into the third period. And after they took one shot on goal in like the first 10 seconds, and then their coach told them, that's enough. Don't shoot. Don't cross the red line. <laughs> so for 20 minutes, they would mm -hmm. cross the red line, dump it in. And the opposition, who I believe was from Beijing, they took the puck up. They ran the same breakout play over mm -hmm. and over, and it did not work. They could not <laughs> enter the offensive zone. So for 20 minutes of virtually uninterrupted play, I'm just I'm spitballing at that point because I'm doing the game alone. Mm -hmm. and it's, it's, you're trying to pull things out of the air of, <laughs> of what to cover in just a lackluster hockey game like that. You have to do something, especially if the team isn't very good. You have to do something to find that – 
find that storyline that's going to get people and, and keep them involved on the broadcast. When you did join the United Hockey League and the Danbury Trashers, you were part of a winning team, one of the most mm-hmm. great teams in hockey history. And I've heard that your job interview for the Danbury Trashers was extremely brief, which tracks for everything else that I've heard about the Danbury <laughs> Uh, what were your first impressions walking in and meeting the story to Jimmy Galanti and 17 year old AJ? My job interview was extremely short and extremely brief. This is indeed true. I knew about the team on April 2nd. So they had an April fool's day press conference to announce the team, which is pretty funny in itself. I don't know if that was on purpose or not. I see this. I see it's in Danbury. I grew up in the Bronx, New York. It's an hour away from me. I'm like, I got to get this gig. I have to get this job. I tried it a couple of different ways. I first had Ken Wilson reach out uh, to Jimmy to see if there was going to be any inroads there. Jimmy didn't even take his call. Fortunately for me, the league office was one town away from O'Fallon. You had O'Fallon and then Lake St. Louis, Missouri. And that's where the commissioner's office was. So I sent my stuff directly to the commissioner and the head of media for the league. And uh, Lisa Pepin, who was the media relations person, she sees my resume. She listens to my work. She's like, oh, wow, he would be perfect for Danbury. He grew up in New York City. He's Italian. He'll probably get along with Jimmy, the whole thing. So I get brought into the office in Lake St. Louis and they call Jimmy and and Richard Brosell says, Jimmy, you got to have a broadcaster. You got to have a media guy. That's one of the things. Now, mind you, Jimmy didn't know anything about running a hockey team. He, he knew, uh, obviously, about the garbage industry, and he knew about race cars. He had the, the mystique, and, and he was a, a race car owner, so he knew that. But that was a little bit different than... Um, you know, sending your car to the track, you're not responsible for selling tickets, putting fans in the seats, getting sponsorships, things along those lines. He didn't want to get sponsorships for his auto racing. That's the whole other thing. He explains this to Jimmy. Jimmy's like, all right, bring him out here. I want to meet him. That was it. That was the whole phone call. Okay. That season, we had the Frontier League All-Star Game. We were hosting the All-Star Game and I was the broadcaster for it on um, Fox Sports Midwest. The very next morning, I hop on a plane to Jersey, to Newark, I drive from Newark to Danbury and I go to the transfer station. I'm sure you've driven by it on White Street many times. Uh, I get in, you know, there's a guy at the front, you know, who are you? And as soon as you mention that you're there to speak with Jimmy Galante, you know, it's like, uh oh, all right, hold the phone. I got to find out if this is real. You know, like three phone calls get made. Yes, I'm here to speak with Jimmy. They let me in. Um, this is a transfer station that literally is immaculate. They dump garbage all day. Like people have to understand this is where all the garbage trucks bring the garbage and then the garbage gets, you know, sent off to, to where the garbage goes. You would never know this. I mean, you saw the trucks come in and out. There was not a speck of garbage anywhere, anywhere in this place. It was pristine. You could eat off the ground. And they had all the big buildings and stuff. And um, Jimmy's building was like the one all the way in the back. And on the outside, it looks rather industrial. And I'm like, all right, this is where the office is. And you're imagining, okay, it's going to be industrial inside. Nope, it's, it's pristine. It's a gorgeous office on the inside. And I go in and I sit with Jimmy and AJ's there. Now, AJ uh, had just graduated high school that spring or that summer. And he had um, injured himself playing hockey. He played for New Fairfield High School. He got hurt. I think it was a knee injury or something. He had like a big thing on his leg. So he's, you know, he's there. So I sit down with Jimmy. Jimmy looks at me, like looks me up and down, like, you know, up and down. He looks at AJ (laughs) sitting next to me. Looks up and down. First words out of his mouth. So Richard Brosell sent you here. Richard Brosell's the commissioner of the UHL. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes, uh, Jimmy. You know, and I knew right away to call him Jimmy, not Mr. Galante. Um, I was, I was, pre, you know, I was told ahead of time. He said, it's Jimmy. He looks at AJ. Looks at me again. His next statement. So how much do you want to make? That was the job offer. That was literally the job offer. <laughs> and what he a went, dangerous he question! For Richard Brosell sent you here. To how much money do you want to make? I have a sense of what the cost of living is in Danbury. It's minor league sports. 
I'm probably going to have to negotiate. Like these are the things that are going in my head. So I throw a number out there, which is not exceedingly high. Now it's not, you know, it's more than what someone in that league would make, but it's not like this crazy excessive number that would get me laughed at and thrown out of the building. Right. So, you know, I put a little thought into it. He looks at AJ, AJ just nods his head and goes, okay. And then Jim, next words. So when can you start? That's my job interview. That's amazing. That literally was a whole job interview. The, the story to tell you about the job interview was longer than the job interview. <laughs> <laughs> um, That's true. <laughs> I didn't know what to expect going in, but all these years later, and that includes, obviously, I, I worked in the American League for nine years. I've done NHL games. I've done a lot in, in my career, really blessed in a lot of ways. Those two years in Danbury are still, as far as professional hockey goes, my two favorite seasons in sports. I mean, it was that much fun. It was a, it was a roller coaster. It was a circus at times, but the hockey was great. I don't, I don't think people really realize like how good the hockey was. I mean, you mentioned how it was a circus at times. True, but 16, 17 years later, it's a fan experience that mm-hmm. still gets talked about. It's so ingrained in the culture of Danbury. And 102 is still nuts now, but I don't feel like we'll ever be able to replicate what that 2004 to 2006 Danbury Trasher atmosphere was like. How quickly do you think the people of Danbury latched onto the team? And when did you know that 102 was 102? Section 102 goes to goes back to New Haven. So a lot of those fans were New Haven Nighthawks fans from way back in the day. So when you talk to the really old time fans and you say Section 14 of the Coliseum, it's the same vibe and the same kind of rowdy atmosphere but you knew pretty quickly and part of that was Jimmy and AJ built a team that really talked to those fans the trashers in both seasons really would have three lines of guys or really two two and a half lines of guys of real skill and then you'd have three or four guys that would just beat the crap out of you yep (laughs) then even some of the guys that were skilled guys could beat the crap out of you too depending on who was in the lineup if Brad Wingfield was in the lineup Uh, He could beat the crap out of you. Season two, there were a lot of guys that kind of shuffled in and out that were really good power forwards that could also, you know, they could score goals, but they could also fight. Once you started seeing the physicality, once you started seeing, you know, the team win some games and and really beat the pulp out of opponents, they did latch on really quickly. The Section 102 fans were always there from day one. It probably took about 10 or 12 games for everyone else to start coming in opening night was a sellout but I don't think there were a lot of people the very next game I mean I think it was over you know probably at least 1500 you know probably half full but it wasn't a sellout but halfway through the first season you started seeing most of these games sell out and you know when we had our Danbury hockey alumni night which was the last regular season game that we wound up playing in the fed season last year we had a couple of those guys that you mentioned come back like uh, Dave McIsaac who Mm -hmm for them uh frank the animal by lois yep. came back and he, he got probably the loudest ovation of any of the players mm-hmm. that came back and he only played in like seven games for the danbury yep. they just they embrace that kind of player do you happen to remember what the harshest burn that you've ever heard one from 102 like even something that you could pick up on the booth you know you'd have like the horse's ass song uh you know insert name is a horse's ass you'd have that one uh, there were there were a bunch of other things. Obviously, the Hell's Horn. When you would turn around, if you're on the visiting bench and you look up and you see body bags being hung and kind of waved at you, that's pretty. That's pretty sick. Um, you know, from any in any way, shape, or form, uh, that was probably those were pretty bad. What was honestly the worst one during the first playoff series that the Trashers had, which was a legendary series, and I don't I don't know if you're very familiar with it. The Trashers played the Adirondack Frostbite. So the Frostbite, you know, up in Glens Falls, they were our number one rival. We played them, you know, seemingly like 15, 20 times a year out of the 76-game schedule. They were owned by Barry Melrose and Steve Levy. So, you know, here's some famous people from ESPN that are part owners of the team. So that was something that we wanted to beat them every time they were out there. And so we got them in the playoffs in the first round. 
Uh, game one, we you know we won inside the first five minutes of overtime. Game two went to a third overtime. There were guys having to be taken up off the ice to get thrown back in the locker room because they were so dehydrated they couldn't move. In Glens Falls, they never stopped selling beer. This game ended like after midnight. It started at seven o'clock. They did not stop selling beer. To make matters more interesting, Jimmy decided to get a fan bus out of his own pocket and bought tickets for about 50 or 60 Section 102 fans. Get on the bus. I'm paying for the whole thing. Go up to Glens Falls and do your thing. Wow. <laughs> so the burn was after the game. So I'm waiting by the bus. Barry Melrose exits. As I mentioned, they never stop selling beer. I'll just leave it at that. And the Section 102 fans, and to Barry Melrose's credit, he didn't do anything. He did not react because it would not have been good, I think, if anyone reacted. So I mentioned the horse's ass song. They 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 sang about five verses of this thing. They were verses I had never heard of. And they just went on and on and on. On Barry Melrose. And, like, you know, it's Barry Melrose. I mean, he's a big deal. We had a pacifier thrown at uh, Ahmed <laughs> Mafoos. Uh, that was a good one. One mm. guy, uh, Peter Panachik of the Carolina Thunderbirds, was doing a shootout against Danbury, gets saved on the first shot, and then angrily shoots in the rebound, which mm -hmm. is a big no-no. Uh, so the next day, when the Thunderbirds are playing the hat-tricks, someone printed out a shirtless Instagram pic of him and like Ooh. posted it on like the, the bench, the, the glass behind the bench, saying, mm -hmm. it's the modeling. <laughs> That's doing your research. That's that's going mm -hmm. yeah. well. I that's so specific. But I, you know what? I respect the effort in that. Yeah. Room. When the Elmira Jackals came to town, they had a player who, by the way, ended up with the Trashers in season two. So uh, he became a Trasher, Jamie Thompson. Tomer was a really talented player, and he was he was a disturber. So he was talented. He'd score goals. He'd do everything. Never really fought much. But he was the type of player that would get under your skin. He would never shut up. He'd yap, yap, yap all night. Um, but the fans in 102 started calling him Krusty the Clown. AJ, I think, was AJ might have been the one that actually came up with Krusty. And on our video, on the video board in Danbury, with my limited Photoshop skills, I actually created a Krusty the Clown graphic of Jamie Thompson. Where he was, you know, it was like the before of him in his like fo press photo or whatever. And then the after with like the clown nose and stuff like that, where he looks now more like Krusty the Clown. And it was the hair. He just had big curly hair. And that's where the Krusty thing came about. Uh, the next season, we signed him. You know, a lot of the visiting players that came in got it. They got it pretty quickly. They knew what it was about. And they didn't get too bummed out about it like it was the type of thing like afterwards those guys if they could if they weren't going to hop on the bus would like hang out with these fans and drink beer with them like that's kind of the atmosphere so it was they were getting ragged on but all in good fun and it was never really uh anything personal that's the crusty the clown thing you know there are very few players or coaches who got upset about it the only one that that i could recall was dave the hammer schultz who was a 1970s you know broad street bully or yeah. flyer he was the interim coach in Elmira, and I guess he kind of took umbrage with Hell's Horn. They would pick up the horn and stick it right in the bench so that the coach couldn't talk during any of the media timeouts or whatever. And he tried to get them kicked out, and they just, you know, the the Danbury police officer that was working just kind of looked at him and was like, are you kidding me? I'm not going to kick this guy out. And you know, <laughs> How many places can you bring a, a fire engine horn into the building? And today you can still bring it in. Yeah. I mean, that's a, you can't, you can't do that anywhere else, nowhere else. And that's what makes Danbury special. Nowhere else on the planet can you get away with that. Nowhere. And nothing gets Danbury fired up quite like fights either, which actually mm -hmm. was, was part of my job interview. Mine was a little longer than yours was in Danbury. <laughs> uh, my, my boss, Herm Sorcher, uh, pulls out his, uh, his phone and mm -hmm. hands me a clip of uh, Colton Orr versus John Scott. And okay. He, and he and he goes call it, mm -hmm. and um, I have to then call a fight. Colton Nor is involved in the ownership in the yep. arena, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. what he he recorded it and sent it to Colton for his, for his approval. So there you go. Hey, that's how you get in the door, right? At the end of the day, I miss calling fights. I mean, it's so 
it's so much fun. And especially in my days with the Trashers, because of what the team was all about in thinking of, okay, how am I going to approach calling these fights for this team? And the, the one name that came to mind was Jim Ross. That was if I need, you know, like everyone's like, well, who inspires you in your broadcast work or whatever? And I, I'll talk about uh, my days learning from Marty Glickman when I was a student at Fordham. And, and in terms of hockey, it was Ken Wilson with the Blues who mentored me. And, and those are the two names that come up first and foremost when it comes to play-by-play and broadcasting. But then there's also part of me, I'll say, well, you know, when I was with Danbury, like the name Jim Ross just would pop into my head and thinking about how he called fights and how he called wrestling and built that drama. And that was a big part of what the Trashers were all about. So that was the voice that was always in my head when I would call fights would be good old JR. They leaned into the spectacle so much mm-hmm. that they actually had John Cena come to a game. I mean, that's, they, that's, that's they awesome. did. <laughs> this is before he won his first WWE championship. He was a U.S. champion at the time. So he wasn't the John Cena that we know of today, but he was well on his way to being that. I mean, the nicest guy. I mean, super, super nice. He was great because he came out a few hours before he met everyone, before anyone came in. Um, you know, we kind of developed what we were going to do in terms of him being on the ice for the intermissions and stuff like that. So it really worked out well. That's not even the highlight of the night is that John Cena was there. It, that, that's not the highlight. The highlight's the brawl. Yes. The bench clearing brawl with the frostbite. And, and when it's the Chad Wagner game and Chad Wagner goes after Mark Podvin, the coach of the frostbite, and try to jump over the bench and like take him out. That's the highlight. I mean, you think about this. John Cena was an A-list wrestler for a million years, is an actor. He's big in Hollywood. I know he's not The Rock, but, you know, everyone knows John Cena. And yet, all these years later, WWE Night is not known for John Cena. It's known for Chad Wagner, of all people. And shifting gears a little bit, Mm -hmm. a lot of bit, to uh, another place where you can't call fights anymore, really, the NWHL, Mm -hmm. uh, which is starting its bubble season this weekend up in Lake Placid. Uh, The Connecticut Whales relocation means you're back in the Danbury Arena broadcast. Mm -hmm. So what can we expect from the Connecticut Whale this weekend and beyond in this Isabel Cup season? It's interesting because uh, there there are a lot of returning players, but a, a fair number of new faces. And I did I actually did a preview. It, it'll be on Twitch. It might be this week. It should be this week with Eric Ayala, who's the you know broadcast analyst with me at at Whale Games. And we were talking a little bit about that. And what's real? The only thing that I think is predictable about the upcoming bubble season is that it's completely unpredictable, in the sense that we're now taking this season. I, I throw that in quotes because it's really just an extended tournament. Right. Right. We're going to have a two week season and everyone's going to have a round, round robin and play everybody. And anything can happen. I think on paper, if we were going to play a 24 game season like a year ago and I were to look at all the teams and I would be like, yeah, the Boston Pride are the best team. Uh, the Toronto Six, I think, will be a very strong team. It's got Digit Murphy coaching. She's a fantastic coach. They brought in a lot of talent. Uh, right off the bat, uh, there's, you know, dear to my heart, a heavy Quinnipiac contingent of players, including their entire leadership group. So I'm excited to see that for the Toronto Six. Um, but I don't know about their goaltending, but I know Boston's goaltending is going to be, you know, fantastic. And then you look at everybody else, I think, after that. Uh, the white cap should be strong as they usually are. The Riveters, I, I'm not sure if they have the goaltending. I'm not. The Whale, I think, are going to be a pretty good team. I think they're going to surprise a lot of people. They did add some forward talent up front in the offseason. So when you look at the returning players, whether it's an Emma Vlasic, uh, Jeanine Weber, who is a a very talented player, and if she has a good couple of weeks, can can really dominate as a power forward. Kayla Friesen, who played her graduate transfer year at Clarkson, who was over a point per game. So I think up front, uh, they're going to be okay. If they can score three goals a game, I think they have a really good chance at being, you know, knock on wood, uh, 
a top three team. Where I really think they stand out is in goal. Uh, when you look at Brooklyn Waleco, had a fantastic season for them last year, and she stood on her head at several points. But mm-hmm. to me, the dark horse is Abby Ives out of Quinnipiac. She's a rookie. Uh, I got to see her with all her home starts for the last three years. And uh, she is a fantastic goaltender. So, you know, I've seen her outduel a lot of the netminders. Um, you know, Louisa Salander, she, she outdueled her in college. Maddie Rooney last season at the Nutmeg Classic. I mean, gold medal winning goalie. She outdueled Maddie, Maddie Rooney. Uh, she seems to play better against bigger opponents. So now she's on a stage where everyone's going to be really talented. So I, I think that's going to get her... Uh, you know, really going here. So it's going to be interesting. I think they're going to be a pretty good team. They added some rookies on defense that are very offensively minded um, to go along with some returning players. Obviously, Shannon Doyle and, and Elena Orlando are, are the two, and Taylor Marchin uh, are the three probably most well-known of the returning defenders. It's anybody's guess. This is, a, this is two weeks, and whoever comes in with the hot hand uh, should do well. There's no reason to expect that Boston wouldn't go, you know, four and one, five and zero, oh, possibly during the round robin. But then it's single elimination after that. You know, as the Whale showed last year, they beat Buffalo and got to the semifinal after winning just two games in the whole regular season. So uh, that's why I mean it's a little bit of a different vibe. Their record is is what it is, but for those who watched the whale closely from beginning to end, their battle level was markedly better, especially after Colton Orr got to town and things got a bit more situated. Mm -hmm. Like their defense was tighter, their special teams were better, and they were able to pull out a surprise victory in, in the playoffs against Buffalo, which kind of ties into the overarching question that that you're posing, which is, can a a scrappy, feisty team like Connecticut, which has gone through a big roster turnover, they do have a lot of skill now, can they outduel a Boston Pride? Do you think that the Connecticut Whale have what it takes to finally get to the promised land where they have never been before? Is this maybe the year? Anything's possible as far as what they may do against the Boston Pride. We can just look back to when they took them to a shootout last season. And Brooke Waleco, I think, had 56 saves in that game and just stood on her head. And Boston had plenty of great scoring chances, and yet it was a a two-to-one game decided in a shootout. So do the Whale have the ability to to hang with the Boston Pride? I think they do. I think they've shown it. Again, it's one of those things. And I think this is where coaching kind of really plays into this because now you have one shot against these teams during the regular season. So – How coaches look at each game, I think back to all the times I would talk with coaches and they wouldn't necessarily talk about their game planning or they wouldn't want to say too much about their game planning and they would give you, you know, it's really about what we do to execute. Um, And that is a big part of it. Absolutely. Don't get me wrong. But I also think it's what do teams do to game plan against certain teams? Why Boston is such a hard team to game plan against is because they're so deep. Right. So like if you if you shut down their top line, well, you know what, their third line can beat you. Um, you know, their goaltender, you know, Lu- Luvisa Salander might just decide to, to throw a shutout that day. That's what makes them hard. They're so deep. If I look at the Riveters where their goaltending is untested, uh, they have Tara Hoffman out of Yale. She was OK. She was good. She's going to have to show to me anyway that she's going to elevate her play uh, for the uh, for the uh, for the NWHL. But if I can, you know, if they, over, if they load up their top line and put, you know, the Madison Packer on a line with, uh, you know, Kelly Babstock and I shut down that top line, do they have depth to beat me? And I don't know the answer to that. You know, maybe they do, maybe they don't. Um, you know, same thing with Buffalo. I think Buffalo has a lot of new faces. You know, they've lost some big players. Uh, you know, they lost their leading scorer. She's not able to play in the bubble. I don't really know what they're going to bring yet. Um, and I think with the whale, I, you know, if you're playing the whale, it's okay. You know, if you can keep them from generating a lot of offensive chances, no matter how good their goaltending is, we might just need two to beat you. So for the whale, it's about generating more offense. And how do they, how do they get that offense and, and become more of a five skater unit as opposed to really relying on like a single line to score? Because if you look at, 
the history of the whale outside of, of season one and probably season two to a point where they didn't have the goaltending in season two, but they could score. Uh, this has been a team the last few years that has had trouble scoring goals. Teams didn't have to do a lot to shut them down offensively. And that's, you know, so like if the whale went out and scored three goals, pretty good chance they're going to win that game. It just didn't happen very often. Before I let you go here, Phil, I want to play a little game with you here where I want you mm-hmm. to rank these moments because you were the voice of the first three Isabel Cup final. The Isabel mm-hmm. Cup final is going to be on NBC Sports, which is a tremendous get for It is. I'm, re- I'm really excited about that. And I think all NWHL fans and all women's hockey fans are really excited. I mean, this is a big moment. If they weren't going to be all in on it, I don't think they would have done it. They, you know, you could throw another Notre Dame game on a Friday night. I mean, they are Notre Dame hockey. They, they could do that. If they weren't going to really commit, um, I, don't, I don't think NBC would have gone all in for it. So it's really exciting. Absolutely. So mm-hmm. as, as the voice of the first three Isabel Cup finals, I want you to rank these Isabel Cup final moments. From okay. Best to least best because they're all great moments. Mm-hmm. But I want you to rank Hillary Knight's overtime penalty shot goal. Brienne McLaughlin's 59 safe performance and Alexa Grushow's airborne goal to win it for the Riveters. Oh, How would you rank tough. those three moments? It It's really tough because they're all, you know, 1A, 1B, and 1C. Yeah. It, it's not, first of all, it makes me, it just, I, I just realized, I'm like, damn, I've called some really good moments in this league. <laughs> um, to, to be able to say that. And uh, I think in terms of sheer unbelievability w- would have to be Brian McLaughlin's performance would be number one because it not that she's not a talent it wasn't a super talented goaltender but it was just completely unexpected and for the Buttes to go out and win that game it it's almost like and I know it's making the rounds on social with Digit Murphy doing the um her Brooks speech Yep. But but you almost could say the same thing here. Nine times out of ten, the Boston Pride are going to win that game. And it ain't going to be close. Especially that season, because it wasn't just, you know, Hillary Knight. It was, it was Hillary Knight. It was Megan Duggan. It was um, Alex Carpenter. It was all of them. They were all there that season. It was, it was basically Team U. If you really think about it, it was Team USA. With the exception of, you know, Falzer and, and Bozek, who at the time were obviously on the Buttes, and Buffalo, the goaltending was, it, it was good, but it was hot and cold, and it wasn't like you had just that one goalie that ran the show. If you remember, the game before, Man, um, Mandy Levier was the goaltender the night before against the, uh, against the Ribs in that semifinal and won that. So they kind of had a split in goaltending, which is a little bit, unfamiliar i think when you think about championship games championship teams it's usually like yeah there's the one goaltender and and she runs the whole show and that's kind of how it goes um so i have to i have to call that number one this the second one is alexa grushow because honestly just the athleticism involved it was the only goal of the game it was an amazing effort she shot the puck when she was in the air yeah she was in the air when she shot the puck now you know the, the moment I'm going to mention obviously is more well known because it it's it just is is Bobby Orr and I you know his Stanley Cup winning goal back in uh, 1970 and that when he was in the air was the celebration he had already shot the puck yep. puck was in the net and then he jumps and he celebrates and they get you know that's where you get the photo in midair so what's the better play I mean <laughs> let's be real. Let's be real. What's the better play? You know, if you're just comparing the two moments, I'm, I'm not going beyond that. Shooting the puck while you're in the air or celebrating? Both iconic. And, and uh, to me, that's number two. And, and Hillary Knight, equally great moment. The difference here is it didn't win the cup. And I think the reason why I ranked that third is it was, yes, it was an amazing, it was an amazing moment. It's a penalty shot in overtime. It's going to decide the game but it did not win the cup because that was a best of three series. You know what? If she fails at that moment, well, they just keep playing, you know, and then something else happens and maybe the pride still win the game. The penalty itself was a little controversial to begin with. I mean, it wasn't super clear cut, um, you know, for the delay of game on that. And, uh, 
but that's it ended up being that way and and you put your best player out there on the ice to to take the penalty shot and and she buried it so and and then Brian McLaughlin gets revenge you know a year later you know with that magnificent performance so she gets revenge and she gets the number one spot in our unofficial official list of great Isabel cup moments from those first three you know cups but then yeah you know what and then you look at the last cup I know I didn't call it but but Lee Steckline winning the cup in overtime is also Mm -hmm. you know think about that I mean that that did win the cup you know I mean that's you know by no means I think if I included that I would have to put that over Hillary Knight as well another reason I think to really get excited about the bubble is you're gonna have a whole bunch of those in a two-week period yeah you know, a whole bunch of them every game means so much because they're so the schedule is so limited these women have been getting like you know i'm sure super antsy to play some games after practicing for months and now to just be in an area where they could just concentrate on that for a couple of weeks it, it's i i'm i'm so excited about it i'm gonna be like everyone else watching at home super excited it's gonna make for great theater and we all can't wait for those games phil thank you so much for for your time and sitting down with me here today uh we can't wait for the start of the nwhl season and we wish you all the best uh we can't wait to have you back up in the booth in danbury arena when the time comes and hope that you and your family are all keeping safe and healthy you too, Casey. I'm very, I was very excited to be here. This was a lot of fun to, to reminisce about the Trashers and get honestly excited yet again. I've been excited for weeks now about the upcoming uh, NWHL bubble. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Take care, Phil. That'll do it for us here on the Hat City Hockey Show. If you like this episode, be sure to click like and subscribe for future content and be sure to follow at Danbury Hattricks on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. I'm Casey Bryant. Take care.